the two options that it, she came to harm at the hands of some member of the family or the friends, or that it was some paedophile who happened to be passing by, are both really, really unlikely. But we know she's gone. The mystery of Madeleine McCann's disappearance became the biggest, or at least the most enduring, news story of the year. Eight months on, detectives still don't know if Madeleine is dead or alive. What makes the case so perplexing is the lack of any trail of evidence beyond this point, the apartment in Prior de Luge, rented by the McCanns for an early summer break. Like many holiday resorts, by day, Luge is bright, whitewashed and family friendly. But at night, outside of the peak season, it becomes a more chilly, eerie place. One of deserted streets, empty promenades, dark corners and shuttered windows. It was on such a night on the 3rd of May that Madeline was left sleeping while her parents went to dine at the nearby tapas bar. At 10 o'clock, when Kate McCann went to check on the children, Madeline had vanished. This apartment is just a few yards from the McCanns. It doesn't go right onto the road, but in all other detail, it's exactly the same. On the night, the shutter was up. The patio door was closed, but it was unlocked. Easy for the McCanns to get in to check on the children. Just as easy for an abductor to get in and out. The tapas bar is over there. The view from there to here is not a good one. It's partially obscured, and of course, at the time, it was dark. In here, the lounge. In the corner, a small kitchen. That's the front door to the apartment. And in here, the parents' bedroom, with the views over the tapas bar and the sea beyond. And furthest away, the children's bedroom. According to Jerry McCann, when he checked on the children, the door was slightly ajar. He thought that was odd. He believes the abductor was already hiding in here when he came in. When Kate McCann checked later, she said the twins were still asleep and Madeline had gone. It's now generally accepted that the police investigation got off to a slow start. There was no real sense of urgency. The first police officer on the scene refused to accept the McCann's view that Madeline had been abducted. In fact, a witness here overheard him telling her parents she can't have been kidnapped, she must have simply woken up and wandered off. That night, the search fell mostly to a volunteer force of holidaymakers and expats like Claire Gelsthorpe. She was searching the beach, these built-up areas, and here, this is very different, isn't it? I mean, there are lots of areas like this. What was, what was the scene here at three, three o'clock in the morning that night? It was dark, nobody around, just us who were searching, and then we stopped, looked around and said, right, where should we go now? because we'd been everywhere and we didn't know where to go. But how many of you were here? Probably about 20 of us. And how many torches would you have had? About two or three. So I don't suppose you could see very far from no, where we're standing? No, there was much light here at all. You get a bit scared. There must be hundreds of these bins around Luge. There is, and if there were bins we looked into. But when you were looking in a bin, were you, did you think you'd find a child hiding or a child that had been killed? You think about anything, a child that had been dumped in a bin or... A child would never hide in a bin, so we were thinking about someone checking the child into the bin. So even at that stage, you were already thinking of the possibility yeah. that Madeline had been killed? Yeah. At 4.30am, the search was called off. The bins were still collected as usual and dumped at the nearby rubbish tip. The police insistence that Madeline had wandered compromised the investigation from the start. Tony Rogers is one of Britain's most experienced detectives. He helped solve the Soham schoolgirl murders. Today he helps police forces review unsolved crimes. If the child's never been missing before, it's a very young age, very vulnerable, it's late at night, the chances of that person wandering off diminish as, as, as a few hours go by. The detective's failure to treat Madeline's disappearance as a crime was to rebound on them. Because they did not immediately seal off the apartment. Because they allowed evidence to be contaminated by people traipsing in and out. Because they did not properly interrogate Kate and Jerry McCann. 
Incredibly, after six weeks, the apartment was returned to the owner and relet twice. And even today, a low gate with a flimsy chain is all that guards this still vital crime scene. I'm disappointed that the apartment wasn't kept. I honestly think in the UK, with a bit of luck, we would have done it very differently. David Barclay is one of Britain's top forensics consultants, involved in many cold case reviews. I've been involved in cases in which a murder's happened in a house and the police have actually bought the house so they could keep the house until after the trial. And in at least one of those cases, we went back and re-examined the crime scene after a year because we thought something had changed about our interpretation and we were able to find cast-off blood on the ceiling of one of the bedrooms that had never been spotted before by working out what must have happened and then looking for confirmation on the, the roof. Right from the start, the McCanns insisted their daughter had been abducted and they've clung to that belief ever since. But how could an abductor get into the apartment? There are two methods of getting into that apartment. One is through the window at the back overlooking the car park. And I think it's impossible for somebody to get in and out through that window without leaving forensic trace. Apart from anything else, the windowsills in that area are covered in green lichen. The minute you try and scrape over the windowsills, you would have left mark. And we know that the scenes of crime lady the next morning was looking for exactly that. But the, the sliding door was left open, unsecure. If it was possible for the McCanns and their friends to, to go inside, look at, check on the kids, it was possible for somebody else to go up the little stairs to the back, open them, take Madeline out, maybe asleep, and leave. Not without leaving any trace, but without leaving any trace that's been found. That's one of the areas that doesn't seem to have been examined. In the UK, we always look at not the crime scene, but the methods of ingress and egress from it, how you get into and out of the crime scene. What makes the case so mysterious is that, as far as we know, the police have no firm evidence of abduction. We've been told that a part of the investigation centres on a bag that went missing from the apartment, a blue hold-all type tennis bag belonging to Jerry McCann. He'd been playing tennis at the complex in the hours before Madeline disappeared. And if it's a bag of, of, of a size that could be taken away from the flat, uh, a child that would be of great interest to the investigating officer. Police do have a witness, Jane Tanner, one of seven friends holidaying with the McCanns. She said she saw a man carrying a child near the apartment 45 minutes or so before Madeline was reported missing. But her description was remarkably vague. She wasn't even sure at first the man was carrying a child, and police considered her an unreliable witness. Six months later, Miss Tanner helped produce another drawing of a suspect, more detailed, even down to the pattern on the child's pyjamas that seemed to match Madeline's. But stranger still has been the case of Robert Murat. Twelve days after Madeline disappeared, police made him an Arguido, a formal suspect. Morning. We're filming for today. He insists he was at home all night with his mother at their villa a hundred yards from the McCann's apartment. But three people claim he was out searching the night Madeline vanished. He admits helping search and translate for detectives early next morning. This is Mr Murat directing police near the McCann's apartment. All the people that know Robert, that were out on that night, that own bars, restaurants, businesses, that closed them all up to go and search for Madeline, uh, were interviewed uh, and questioned by the police. And they have all didn't see him. They, of course they didn't see him. He wasn't there. Uh, but three complete strangers who have never met him before uh, say that they saw him in the dark uh, with his dodgy eye, uh, which actually is a detached retina. It is not a glass eye, by the way. Um, it, I can't understand that. That question has to be answered. And those three people are? The friends of the McCanns. In a remarkable tactic, the detectives later invited the three friends back to the Portimao police station where they identified Murat. 
it's thought the police have no forensic evidence linking Murat to Madeline's disappearance. So who else could have taken her? Abduction for sexual purposes of children is eight, nine, ten years old. It is really, really unusual to want to take a child of three and a half. It would be something overcome by the urge at that time. I mean, how often can you do that and get away with it? There are no people in Priya de Luge who've got that sort of history. Uh, I mean, no people who've got that. They, they have been all looked at. They didn't check up on the other people staying in the apartment. You, I can imagine that if you were a paedophile, one of the things you might do is actually go on holidays at that time of year, where you've got small kids playing in the swimming pool and stuff like that. Police investigated 52 British sex offenders with links to the Algarve. One is still a potential suspect. The fact is that if someone had wanted to take Madeline, the dark streets and car park around the apartment would provide perfect cover. And there are numerous escape routes out of town. If she'd been taken and killed, the hinterland north of the Algarve offers countless places to hide a body. It's a vast mix of rolling hills and mountains, often dense forest and desolate scrub, dotted with thousands of disused wells and long abandoned farm buildings. It's an almost impossible task. If Madeline's out there, will she ever be found? That's a devastating thought for her parents. But detectives were exploring another, more chilling theory. In September, the investigation took a dramatic turn. Kate and Jerry McCann were called in for more questioning and then made our guidos. Detectives accused Mrs. McCann of being involved in Madeline's accidental death. Suddenly, people in Portugal and in the UK began to question their sympathy for the couple. And then we started to think the unthinkable. And you know, nobody wants to think that. Nobody wants to think that this charming couple, they're professional, they're both doctors, they're, again, as we said, both articulate and well presented. Is it possible they were involved? And that was, that's not comfortable. Even now, people sort of say, well, I don't want to think that. But why did they leave those children alone? What happened that night? What was going on? It's a fact that continues to influence public opinion, which is often hostile to the McCanns. How could they leave their three young children alone while they whined and dined nearby? I'm in the tapas bar. I'm sitting at the table where the McCanns and their friends were eating on the night that Madeline disappeared. This place is shut now for the winter. The apartment is some distance away. It's beyond the swimming pool. There's a wall and a hedge, and behind that is a path. It would be very difficult from here to see anybody going in and out of the apartment. Going to check on the kids wasn't easy. I think if you know the location here, which you've seen, uh, what we did, uh, I think, and then we've been reassured by the fact in the thousands of messages from people who have either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. For us, it really wasn't very much different to having dinner in your garden and the proximity of the location. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the guilt that we feel having not been there at that moment will never leave us. Many consider Mr McCann's analogy unconvincing. And a neighbour said that on a previous night, she heard Madeline wake up and cry for her parents for two hours. Well, 80 paces as far as the gate the distance between the tapas bar and the apartment, not quite as Jerry McCann described it. We've established that the apartment is owned by a woman called Ruth McCann, a teacher from Liverpool. She and Kate and Jerry say they are not related, and the name is purely a coincidence. But it's enough to add one more conspiracy theory to the thousands that continue to circulate. 
Portuguese police sources say the potentially crucial evidence against the McCanns is forensic. Madeline's blood found in the apartment. If you find a small amount of blood from Madeline in that apartment, it, it really means very little because she's supposed to be in there and four-year-olds fall over and cut themselves all the time. One of the things you'd be looking for would be signs that something had been cleaned up that hadn't been told you by the parents, whether it was the McCanns or any other crime like this. You're looking for things that don't fit, anomalies in the story they tell you and the results you get. More crucial, perhaps, is what's said to have been found in the McCann's hire car, rented 25 days after Madeline's disappearance. Police sources described blood traces, hair and bodily fluid, and one complete match to Madeline's DNA, evidence, police say, of the girl's body in the car. I guess that's, that's a theory that's necessary because of the alleged findings of blood, body fluids and hair from Madeline in the hire car. Uh, and it's those findings that, I, like all forensic scientists, when they came out, I was going, what? That just does not make sense. And it still doesn't, because the only explanation can be that the body's been kept somewhere for that length of time. It seems very a strange thing to do and very unlikely um, that you'd manage to, with all the publicity on the McCann's, that they would actually manage to do that. And it's really unpleasant to have to move a body, anybody, after that length of time. It is an explanation that is the only one that adequately explains those findings if, if they're correct. Astonishingly, having established the hire car as a potential crime scene, the police gave it back to the McCanns. The couple even drove it to the police station when they were declared suspects. The McCanns say their own experts' tests on the vehicle found no trace of Madeline. Any DNA in the boot may have come from the twin soiled nappies and Madeline sandals when they moved apartments. We've since established that the car was returned to the hire company and then handed back to its supplier's Renault. The vehicle could still hold vital clues, yet it ended up in a second-hand car lot near Lisbon. Less tangible evidence is the so-called scent of death around Kate McCann's clothes, said to have been detected by sniffer dogs from the UK. Mick Swindles is one of Britain's leading dog handlers. The best way to describe it is, is if you have a fragrant soap, you can smell it, but there's nothing, there's nothing physical coming between the soap and your nose, it's just scent. But when it's something non-tangible, it's very difficult for humans to comprehend it. Uh, one thing we do have though is that the dog does not have the ability to lie, they cannot lie, uh, they, don't, it's not, they don't know about lying. Uh, so if a dog does indicate then it generally believes that yes there is something there. Sometimes the McCann's own behaviour has fuelled suspicion. I understand the police did ask for Cuddle Cat but it had been washed. We all find that very strange. Why would you wash? Cuddle cat. It's the last thing that was your, your daughter's favourite possession. It's still got the scent of your daughter on it. It must have. The idea that it got grubby and you put it in a washing machine fairly late on in the investigation strikes me as being bizarre. It's always been a difficult story for reporters to follow. Police use the Portuguese secrecy law to avoid any official comment, but leak the most scurrilous stories to the local newspapers. I mean, the vagrancies of, of the story haven't affected the facts that there is a little girl missing and her parents are waiting for her to come home. Uh, nothing's changed in that regard. And, and the ups and downs, and, and here, I've, obviously, the media has played a real role in this. I mean, the sensationalism and sensationalizing of the whole thing has certainly affected many people's opinions, but it hasn't really affected ours. I mean, to some degree, we've tried not to listen. The new detective in charge of the case, Paolo Rabello, has been reviewing the investigation for several months, but forensic evidence may not be enough on its own. It's absolutely true that DNA could never convict someone in court, and the courts have legally found that you cannot do that. You need some other piece of evidence to bolster it up, to corroborate it. I suspect that the investigating officer will be praying for the day when when Madeline is found and if she's been tragically murdered, that scene will give up so much information and so much evidence that will help to explain um, the gaps in the, in the story that we've got at the moment. 
At the end of 2007, Mr and Mrs McCann refuse to believe that Madeline is dead. But a happy conclusion to the mystery seems increasingly unlikely. Without that, they may face 2008 with a cloud of suspicion still swirling around their heads, while the world wonders how a little girl can just disappear off the face of the earth. <laughs>